Welcome to the Logistics of Logistics, a podcast dedicated to exploring how things get places and the people who get them there. We'll talk with logistics and supply chain leaders about innovation, industry trends, and the future of the logistics business. Now, here's your host, Joe Lynch. Hello, friends. Welcome to the Logistics of Logistics podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. Today's topic is Ocean Freight Survival Guide with my friend Nathan Strang. How's it going, Nathan? Pretty good, Joe. Thanks for having me on. I'm excited to have you on. I've talked to people from Flexport before, and um, always, always a good, good guest to have on because you guys know things. <laughs> you know stuff over there. So, Nathan, please introduce yourself and your company, where you're calling from today. Yeah, my name is Nathan Strang. I'm joining you from Long Beach, California. So, I actually live within sight of the ports. When I go for a run or a walk around my neighborhood, I can see the uh, the cranes out there uh, loading and unloading freight. So. I'm pretty close to it, so nicely done. Yeah, it, that's I, a nice area. It's not bad. I, I enjoy it here. But let's talk a little bit about Flexport first, and then I'll I'll kind of get into me. So, what's Flexport? We're a global uh, freight forwarder and an NVO. We serve it. What is an NVO? Oh yeah, sure. NVO is a non-vessel owning common carrier. So basically, what that means is we operate as if we were a carrier. We just don't any, own any of the physical assets. So what that allows us to do is be a little bit more diverse in how we present rates and service options and attachments to our services. So we aren't selling direct carrier products. We're building our own products, packaging them together, and then selling them to our clients, which I think adds a, a little bit more value to to what we do. All right, continue. <laughs> yeah, we're. Uh, I, th- I think what we're really known for is being a tech-based forwarder, and, and, and I don't know that that always translates well or people understand what that means. But what it really means is that we try and use tech to make logistics easier. We want to increase and and amplify the client's experience with us. So make it easy for them to see their offerings, to communicate with their operations teams, to be able to learn more about the freight world that they're that they're moving through, and also to give them as much data as they could possibly have in order to to make the best decisions possible. And that's what we really mean by tech. I don't think that any business these days can survive without like a computer backbone or something like that. So that all just kind of comes with the landscape. I think what's interesting is, and I actually had a podcast a few years ago with my friend uh, Sharm, who we used to work at Flexport. He said hello, and we talked about as things digitized, you know, and so we first, when we first got the capability, we wired within our four walls, we would work on a network in our company, a company network, sometimes no access to the outside. Then we think about logistics was kind of late to the party. Well, why? Because I might be working with, if I'm a freight broker, thousands of carriers, hundreds of carriers. If I'm a, a manufacturer, I have how many suppliers, right? I might have might have sent them EDI, hey, send me these parts, but it was slow moving to get logistics and the transportation, and I'm talking domestic transportation logistics. You guys, when we talk about freight forwarding, when we talk about ocean freight or air freight, we're talking countries and cultures and dozens of companies. And I think you guys, if if I think about the average move you guys have, I think there's 14 people touch as opposed to a domestic trucking transaction, it's two or three or four. Yeah, and I think another thing too is that you mentioned in logistics, there's so many different organizations too, right? If you're trying to do this on your own and you got to connect into your supplier and the ocean carrier and your customs broker and your trucking provider and the warehouse and the terminal, that gets very daunting, especially for a smaller business. And for what we do at Flexport is we connect all of those together for the client. So bring them all together so they can use, so they can interface with them all on our platform. They can share information. They can share the documents. You know, ocean shipping is still very much a paper-based industry. They, they say they're getting away from paper, but really they're just transitioned to PDF, which is just fancier paper, right? And why? I think it's because it's, it's been slow, right? It hasn't had, you know, air has moved a lot faster, I think, because air moves fast. You need to clear documents faster. You need to clear customs faster. That plane is leaving today, arriving today. In an industry where the ship leaves today, it doesn't show up till the end of next month. I don't think the I don't think that the pressure was there to kind of modernize the system and and also just the number of players right in any of those in any of those transactions getting them all in the same system is just it's difficult. Yeah, when I think about I'm again uh, I'm a supply chain guy originally from automotive and 
we used to think, you know, when I did lean and value stream mapping workshops, we'd go from order to cash. You know, from the time I give that order to that vendor till the time I get paid by my customer, right? So we get this, we have this long, long end to end cycle. And when you think about over the, over, over the ocean, I've got, I've got transportation providers in, let's just say China or Europe or wherever it's coming from. And they might, all it takes is one or two of those guys to say, oh, well, we don't have, we're not connected. We don't play, we don't play that game, right? We're not there yet. And by the way, if I was a trucking company and I'm spending millions of dollars on trucks, I might spend less on tech. That just makes sense. These are low margin businesses in many Very cases. Much. So it, if you're a tech company and say, of course we spend on tech. Well, if you're an asset-based company, you might be less likely. If you're a small company on the other side of the world that doesn't particularly value what Flexport is trying to do, yeah, you guys got to you guys got to wade in and educate them. <laughs> yeah, it's difficult in in an ocean freight especially. It's very it was very low margin until the last couple of years. We've seen the profits of the carriers in the last couple of years, but we forget the the amount of losses that they had in the decades prior. And yeah, where do they invest? Do they invest in more ships? Do they invest in more people on the ground doing sales, or do they invest in tech? And to, and they have to justify those investment decisions to their to their board and to their investors. Right. So, <laughs> right. It's if they're going to come out and roll out, oh, we're going to we're going to introduce this new, um, you know, CRM, ERP, whatever system, and it's going to be you know two billion dollars. They're like, or we could buy fifteen more ships. <laughs> yeah, I think also you know there's people who are let's just say my age in. Uh, senior management and they came up the old way and then somebody says you know this everything's going tech and you go ah you know i'm not a tech guy got a tech guy down the hall he manages the website i think we're all right (laughs) i think that's a great point because there are a lot of the the traditional people out there and i don't want to say that you know old people because it's just the way that they were brought up in the industry and they hear tech and they recoil from it and i think that that's part of our mission as well at flexport is to communicate and that's why you see us out here is that we don't want tech to seem like something, right. you know, out of this world. We want it to be like, no, this is an enabler. This helps you. This takes all those things that you learned and all that knowledge that you grew up with and enhances it. It makes it better. Yeah. I should also say, just because people are older, one of the things there's always this common misconception that older people won't adjust. They've adjusted a lot more than you have in this life because yeah. we didn't, I mean, I'll, I'll throw myself in that category. We've gone from, you know, a world that was very different in the seventies and the eighties and nineties and, and uh, to the two thousands and beyond. And so we're used to it, but maybe if their whole management team isn't from that background, they're going to be slow moving to get to it as compared to a Flexport, which started off saying, we're going to use technology to solve a, an age old problem. Absolutely. Anyway, enough about Flexport. <laughs> we'll come back to Flexport in a minute, but t- tell us a little bit about you, Nathan, where'd you grow up? Where'd you go to school? Give us some background on you. All right. I grew up in upstate New York in the Albany, New York region. Balmy resort area? Yeah. Well, I mean, a little <laughs> bit. We had Saratoga, the, the racetrack that some people are now, it's become much more popular in the lakes and the Adirondacks. It's beautiful this time of year. Yeah, it is. It is. It's about to turn gray and gray for the next uh, three or four months, but it's I, I miss I do miss the seasons, although I live in California. If you like a season, you can just drive to it. Like fall will soon be within a two hour drive of us here. And then I can always just come back to spring. But from there, I went to college uh, in New York City, at a small private school called Manhattan College, which is actually a fun fact, not in Manhattan. It's in the Bronx. <gasps> Uh, was that founded by uh, Rockefeller Money? No, that's I can't remember the name of that one. But Manhattan College is actually LaSallean Christian Brothers. It's a Catholic school. They were related. I went to a LaSallean Christian high school. And then I was able to get a scholarship. So I was able to go there. Very college, nice. So. What'd you study? Uh, well, this is the problem. I decided to be a poli sci major. So I was really big into history and political science. And I love comparative politics, especially. And then realized, oh my, I, I need to eat. I need to get a job. So I was always thinking about joining the military. I was always kind of interested in that. I went to a military high school, I had military in my family, Navy and Army, and, and I just started talking to recruiters. And I figured out that I could live my Top Gun dream and fly off of aircraft carriers if I joined the Navy. So I did. I joined the Navy. I went to wow. Officer Candidate School in Pensacola. Then I went through jet flight school as a, as a backseater, so as a weapons systems officer or NFO, as they call it in the Navy. So I like to throw in both the Air Force terms there because more people know it. But 
it was uh but it was fun and and it was interesting and it was very challenging and and i loved it i spent four years flying off of aircraft carriers with with my friends and then transitioned to land-based patrol aircraft and made a career out of it. I, I retired after 20 years. But then again, I realized I needed to get a job and, and feed my family. So I started looking at what there's to do. And I, a lot of what you do in the military is problem solving. It is, and there's a logistics problem solving as well. I was a maintenance officer. I had to get parts around the world. I had to ship them. I had to understand customs. I had to move these things and understand their timelines and what the best mode was and and make those decisions in real time. And in the military, we have a really good freight forwarder called U.S. Transportation Command, and I saw them work their magic, and I became interested in it. That then transitioned into me going to grad school. Before you leave that military thing, I think it's interesting um, for anyone who wants to look back in history. Logistics was invented by the military, and people who weren't good at logistics didn't win wars. And we don't think of it that way. But I think if you go back to World War II and say we were able to supply the Allies better than the Axis was able to supply there. And and on top of that, with better stuff, it just consistently better stuff. And I think that war came down to oil in a lot of ways and logistics. And by the way, that in no way do I want to take away from anybody who's on the front line, but it's the behind the scenes, the guys who says, here's the guns, here's the bullets, here's the, everything. And I'll throw one other thing. I say this every once in a while when I talk about military logistics is most of us are used to supplying somebody who's in a location. Military people move, right? And in addition, they're trying to kill you while you deliver that stuff to to this moving target. And you're not and you're delivering it oftentimes very close to an enemy. So, it is a whole different level of professionalism required. Oh yeah, and and I think when you think about it, you said the moving. I think that people who are long range hikers probably probably have the best who aren't in the military probably have the best appreciation for it. If you hike the Pacific Coast Trail or the Appalachian Trail, you realize you can't carry everything you need. You have to plan out where do I pick up my food, where do I pick up my extra supplies, how do I get water. So if you think about these troops moving across a battlefield, they can only carry so much. You're going to expend ammunition very quickly. You're going to go through your food very quickly. You can only carry a couple days worth of food. So to have that constant resupply all the way to the front lines of these of these goods, yeah, that was fascinating. And, and just also thinking about one of my last jobs, I was a strategic planner, and you have to think about these depletion rates and how when's your next logistics move coming in? How quickly are you depleting? gasoline. For me, it was anti-submarine warfare. So sonar buoys and torpedoes and just spare parts. How long will it take? How long will it take for you before you need to replace an engine? Things like that. Just trying to get those, those rates and making sure that everything's out there. It was, it was a, it, it's, it's a logistics challenge. And that's why I think that's why, you know, one of the reason I ended up at Flexport, I also had a weird confluence of circumstances. I was going into the grad school. I was talking beginning to talk about grad school because um, I did it on the GI Bill, so military connection there. And the cohort study that we did was on a Flexport client. So I was introduced to Flexport there and started learning a little bit more about the company and, and interesting there. And then I just also found out that someone who went to my undergrad university was at the company, reached out to them, got an interview, and now I'm on a podcast talking to you. So Right. So now did you move to Long Beach when when you were with the military? No, I was in San Diego. So I moved to Long Beach for Flexport. Okay. Very nice. Very nice. So when did you join Flexport? Joined Flexport in the spring of 2018. So I've been here a little over four years. So you saw some explosive growth. You guys are kind of changing that space. Uh, yeah. There were four, a little over 400 employees when I joined. And in the LA office, there were about 20 of us. And now there's, I think we're well over 3,000 in LA with the office in the warehouse is probably close to 300. And then I, we have people overseas too, I take it? Absolutely. We got offices in, I should probably know this off the top of my head, but a bunch of countries. Everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> Everywhere. We do really. Everywhere I mean, you need it. Oh, I see your cats over there. Very nice. Oh my. <laughs> yes. That's Ms. Tabitha. She will make an occasional appearance in all of my, uh, all of my webinars and podcasts. <laughs> that's what they do. So guys, in, in case you're not aware, if you should... Uh, 
look up Flexport, the Flexport story. I, I did see Ryan Peterson, your founder, on the cover of Forbes not so long ago. And actually, I think I'm on LinkedIn with him and he wrote something like, shout out to my dentist because he's got that big smile on that Forbes. <laughs> it looks like a movie <laughs> star. But I've had people on Flexport before. The the, the technology that you guys are bringing, I've, I've, I've had a demo of Flexport and it's probably a few years of date, out of date, but it's super impressive compared to when I used to manage a little third-party logistics company every once in a while we moved something overseas or from overseas and boy oh boy that was a that was a difficult system lots of paperwork faxing and it literally faxing stuff back and forth and flexport has kind of taken a lot of that that nonsense away but anyway today's topic is ocean freight survival guide with my friend nathan strang Nathan, why do I need a survival guide? I'm sure everything's working as smoothly as can be. <laughs> Absolutely. Everything is just great. There's there's no controversies or, or issues out there at all. Um, everything is just moving, moving just fine. Why do we need, I think the last two years have shown why we need a survival guide, right? And I think that in the last two years, people have also kind of felt like, oh, this is anomalous. This is this is just the pandemic. And, and a lot of it obviously was driven by the pandemic and pandemic spending habits. But if you kind of look at right where we are right now in terms of inbound freight and volumes, we've kind of reached the glide slope that we left in 2019. So we're back on to um, reversion to the mean now. So this kind of is now normal. The amount of, of shipments that you see coming in, the congestion that we're still seeing at the port, the challenges that we're seeing with the inland movement. This is a, a bit of what it's going to look like for here on out. I think that there will be variance in it, of course. I think that there will be more seasonality coming back to it. But when you look at imports inbound growing versus infrastructure improvement, imports were going to overrun that infrastructure in two to three years. If talking about 2019, it was going to happen in two to three years anyways. And and we just kind of accelerated that process. And there we are. So, so I published a podcast yesterday. So today is 8-23, August 23rd. I published a podcast yesterday and I listened to it again, which by the way, all of you should listen to my podcast at least twice. (laughs) But anyway, um, I interviewed Peter Tershwell from JOC. And by the way, they have a conference coming out to Long Beach in February. And JOC tracks a lot of the probably this a lot of the same research you got. You guys probably share research, I'm guessing, or at least reference the same stuff. And one of the things he talked about was our imports jumped up during COVID. But if you look right now, we are 30% higher on imports than we were prior to COVID. So when somebody says, oh, well, the COVID breakdown, we did have labor problems. We've all experienced them. Walk through your town and see how many restaurants aren't open on Monday and Tuesday. It's it's kind of crazy. How many businesses did you, I, I went to my barber and she's closing and she said I closed. She's closing because things changed during COVID. People had other options. They work from home. A lot of restaurants, a lot of stores, warehouses, dock workers, truck drivers. And that's not counting the actual sickness, illness around the world at different times. So we had 30% increase. We would have suffered from that if we didn't oh, yeah. suffer from labor problems. But we got both. Yeah, and 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 the labor problems are resolved a little bit. But also, you know, if you look at unemployment in the United States, I think we're down to around 3.5%. That's pretty much full employment. There's not a whole lot of additional labor out there. So when you're looking at one of the big topics is always around warehousing, right? The real estate's the easy part. You can go find a warehouse probably. If you can't, you can probably build one. It, that takes a while. But also, how long does it take to train a warehouse general manager, to train shift managers, floor managers, stock keepers, drivers for your forklifts and, <laughs> right. and pallet trucks, right? Like all of that takes time. I think that we've kind of come to this thing like, oh, we'll just hire people. It's like, where are these people? Who where are these trained? Exactly. Individuals? And I'd say this is one of the challenges. One, one of the good things about being in the United States, we're a wealthy country. So if you have children who at some point say, hey, dad, I think I want to go work at a warehouse, you might say, well, that's great experience. Go to one with technology, Uh, become part of the supply chain, learn, learn how e-commerce works, right? If you say you're going to be there, you're going to be a strong back and you're going to walk 10 miles a day, you'd be like, no, 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 let's, let's get you back to school. Let's figure this out, right? So I think we 
won't take a lot. There's a lot of people, myself included. I, I'm too old for those manual jobs at this point. But if I have, I have two daughters and if they w- were in that position to take those kind of jobs, I would say, we'll make the most of it. But also, I could go work in the gig economy. There's so many options. I can work remote. I don't have to. So I can't imagine how hard it is to get warehousing, guys. I do have the conversation every once in a while. I think the key is technology to to make more of each guy, but also for that gal who does decide to work in there, not only do you want her to be super effective and efficient, you also want her to feel like this is a great job. Oh yeah, absolutely. They need to be uh, people who are proud of where they work, work harder and people who enjoy what they work, work harder. I mean, there was a great article because railroad is suffering another, another labor shortage right now. And there was an interview and someone pointed out, you know, if you're talking about taking a train from Los Angeles to Dallas through the American Southwest in the middle of summer, it's 120 degrees and one of the brakes on one of the well cars seizes up and you have to get out of your cab and walk a mile to find the seized brake, release it, and then walk a mile back to your cab, which is unair conditioned. That's a, a certain kind of person that's willing to do that kind of work. Uh, By the way, I know that the, the I looked it up. You're in Long Beach. The, the guys working in Long Beach make at the port average $194,000. I've quoted $174,000. I saw the update as $194,000. And that's, well, maybe this brings us to one of the other turmoils is we potentially have a strike there on the West Coast, right? I know, I know last I heard people were optimistic that we wouldn't, but what's, uh, what's Nathan Strang and Flexport say? I know that Nathan's opinion is I don't think we're going to see a strike. I don't think that the, the you would see a strike if the union and the PMA, which is the, the employment organization out here that represents the terminals and the carriers, if they were further apart on issues, I think you would definitely be moving towards a strike. I don't think that they started very far apart. That was a good thing. They've already settled the big money number, which is their health care, dental care and benefits. So that was already signed. It seems like a lot of the stuff that they have to figure out now is kind of the 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 additionals, I would call them, the other things. Work rules, yeah, stuff yeah, like that. Work rules. I automation gets a lot of, of press, but I don't think that they're actually far apart on automation either. I don't think we're gonna see any expansion based on from the last agreement from 2017. I also personally don't think that the terminals are in a really good spot to automate. It's one of those things when you talk about investment again, it's it's a billion or more dollars to upgrade a terminal to automation. And if the terminal isn't well designed and it isn't efficient, you can't make a terminal more efficient by automating its inefficiencies. And a lot of our terminals just aren't designed to take on automation. If you look at Long Beach Container Terminal down here, which is you know prized for its efficiency, it was designed efficiently. If it was non-automated, it would still be a very efficient terminal. The automation helps that. But right. I also think another thing about those jobs down there at the at the at the terminals, and you're talking about tech. A lot of them are more tech. If you look at a crane operator, right? It's joysticks right. and computers, clerks. You're working at a computer desk. The the drivers are all computer dispatched. It's there is a lot more tech enablement there, and it makes the job a little bit more satisfying. And well, hopefully satisfying less dangerous general, too. Yeah. I mean, at one time working in prior to containerized freight, and we won't get into this whole whole topic, but um, before containerized freight stuff, we wouldn't have we wouldn't have global trade like we do. The world would be a much poorer place if we did not have yeah. uh, containerized freight. But prior to having all that, it cost a lot more to load and unload a boat. But on top of that, America's uh, imports are are coming right by me right now. So. So if you work with Flexport and you're wondering where your stuff is, sometimes they can have Nate look right out his backyard and tell you. <laughs> but, Unfortunately, um, that is true. <laughs> but beyond, um, b- before we got the containerized freight, there was it was a super dangerous job. Longshoremen were injured, killed on a regular basis. And, and then beyond that, there was horrible theft at those locations. There was inefficiency. You know, and I think it, it, those, that's, that was the nature of seaports for a long time. But you know, if you're if you're at a job where there's a good chance you get hurt or killed, you might take it a little. You might take a handful of uh, goods every once in a while. But anyway, one other thing, and I heard this from Peter Tershwell, is this is an election year, and he says that the Biden administration would be very interested in having this not become a, a strike because when you have a strike at C, uh, the port, there's that is almost the definition of how you create. 
uh, economic problems, right? <laughs> Yeah, but I think America, with the with the way we do elections, it's kind of almost always an election year here. So yeah, exactly. So running for office. So <laughs> when did I don't it think end, right? any administration would want to see the ports shut down for sure. I don't think under under any circumstance. It just creates too much disruption. Like you said, we've, we've become very accustomed to inexpensive goods. Inexpensive everything. You, you mentioned uh, talking earlier to me that you come from the auto industry. And, you know, auto parts are very critical, but you don't want them to cost too much, right? Because those are component parts. It drives up the price of the of the goods. So... When you're looking at the imports, if, if you're importing, I don't know, these pillows back here or this picture frame, the more volume that's coming, it helps your auto parts arrive faster and at a cheaper rate because you're adding more supply to the system, more demand to the system. You know, you're, you're able to, to build more efficiencies around that rather than in the old days where you might have needed your own bespoke ship to bring in your right, auto parts right. all the way in and you have, you know, and, and, and that is very expensive if you have to build your own supply chain. And I think we saw that a little bit last year with some of those charter runs from some of the bigger companies, they realized, yeah, this is convenient, but convenience comes at an extreme price with a lot of difficulties. <laughs> right. Well, I had your comrade, Neil Jones Shaw on the podcast talking about air freight uh, last year. And I think he said 1% of volume, 1% of the imports goes on by air, but it's 30% of the value. So that's that's where your mobile phone might go or chips or vaccines. And you mentioned the charters. That's kind of a somewhere between air freight, which is super expensive, and ocean freight, which is the most economical. But anyway, let's switch gears. So we do have we we even though even though COVID is hopefully waning, it's still a problem in much of the world. We do have labor shortages, whether they're related to COVID or not, who knows? We know we have labor shortages. We also have energy issues around the world right now. Some some self-inflicted. Um, as we try and become green, I know governments think, hey, we can switch to, we can switch to solar or air. We're going to get rid of coal. We're going to have to figure that out. I mean, they, their head's in the right place. I just don't know that, or the, let me, wrong way to say it, their heart's in the right place. I don't know that their head is, <laughs> but we have problems. And then on top of that, enormous demand. We are buying more, 30% more than we were pre-pandemic. So we need the Ocean Freight Survival Guide. So when we, before we hit record, we ta you talked about four different things we need to do. So what is the first thing if I say, Nathan, help me survive this? <laughs> yeah, the first conversation I have when, when, when I have this exact conversation with a client is, what are your risks, right? What does your supply chain look like? Let's start at the manufacturing side with, with your purchase orders and, and with your order management solution. And when do you make your orders? What's your seasonality? And then what does your supply chain look like? What ports are you moving from? What ports are you moving into? What is the final destination of your goods? All that is really important. And I think people, you know, can... And, and most people who have been around the industry don't think this way, but some people can definitely think like, I just need to move it and then it'll just go this way. And, and I don't really think about it that hard. I just need to get it on a, on a ship and I need to move it. It's like, well, yeah, that can be true, but let's talk about the whole plan. Let's work all the way through. And, and from my Navy background, I understand that you can't just plan pieces, right? You have to plan the whole mission right? from inception all the way through execution and delivery and let's find out where that is and i think that's the first part of the conversation that has to happen it's just that understanding and level setting yeah so it's it's you want to be that it's that current state assessment and understanding where my current risks are and and i'm just thinking out loud for a second i'm i'm, I'm guessing since you guys are a tech company dressed up as an <laughs> nvo <laughs> um yeah you're probably well, you both, but I, I tend to think of us as an NVO dressed up as a tech company. Right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> I deal with more, I deal with freight more than I deal with tech. Yeah. Well, it, it's, <laughs> but yes, you guys have data and so you can share data that, and, and again, that has not been the history of your business at all. <laughs> so you guys can say, Hey, let, let's look at the data and you have research, but I'm also guessing you guys can bring a lot of different options to somebody you might say, hey, you're, you're going into Long Beach right now, but we can move you into blank and save you money or speed the time or whatever. So you, you guys have a different view, I will say. Yeah, and, and the tech is really important and the data that we have is really important because that enables those conversations that I talked about in point one. And it allows those clients to have access to information they might not necessarily have. 
that can also be distilled by our research departments and, and by our data teams. So in a, in a way that makes it easy to understand. And then the, the second point is like, okay, how do we do this, right? And, and I think those diversified solutions and those ways around the congestion are the second thing that we kind of bring to the table. Because as an NVO, we put together our own packages of solutions and we try and find the best fit for our client rather than selling a very specific product. You know, Carrier A's product or Carrier B's product. We take a look at everything that we have in our portfolio and we try and make the best match. That includes those alternative solutions. So we talk to the client about, you know, obviously what they're comfortable with, their alternatives. But for instance, we have access to the fast boat option. So we always hear about fast boats. So for example, Matson CLX service, uh, CMA's EXX, Zim's ZEX services. We have that. We have access to that f- full portfolio, which gives them a faster transit time, gives them b- faster availability here at destination. And if that if they value that, we have that for them. We have a solution called Flow. Flow is a, a new solution that we just launched. It's a consolidation, what you would call LCL for e-commerce, but it differs. Um, LCL in the past was kind of like sending a letter in the mail. You would put a stamp on it. You would put it in there. Right. You would, it would show up. This is much more like doing Overnight or Express, full tracking the whole way, digital, tied into your e-commerce supply chain. But even if you're not e-commerce, it's a faster solution for you. You can, you can bring things to market in smaller quantities rather than having to wait to fill up a full container. It just gives you another option. The, the last one before I pause, we also have our, our own rail provider. We contract with a private rail provider so that we can get around the rail congestion. It's something that a lot of, um, uh, it's, it's, there's some challenges with it, and a lot of other forwarders or NVOs won't, won't want to accept those challenges. But it's something we want to be able to offer our clients and explain that to them. This is what we can do for you, which bef- before I go on to the third point, which is price. Um, <laughs> well, let me, right. I, I got a few questions for you in this. So you mentioned carrier. So I just saw this yesterday. So I see the the Longshoreman Union is negotiating with a group of carriers and ports. And it said 70 carriers. Now, I, I we all drive by rail yards or whatever. And you go, oh, look at all the names on there. So I know 10, maybe. I think I think I could list 10. And it said 70. So there's 70 different carriers that are working out of Long Beach in LA. I was afraid you were going to ask me to name them all. No, no. Well, I think we know that I think the thing is that the longshoremen deal with all shipping. So we think in terms of containerized freight, but we also have to remember there's the oil carriers, there's bulk, bulk yep. carriers. They also deal with the cruise ships, which if you ship through Miami is very evident because few people know that Miami, the cruise ships get labor priority over the container ships. So if you happen to be there on Royal Caribbean's departure day, your container is going to sit a few more days. So that's where I think the 70 number comes in, is that there's a lot more to shipping. There's a lot more to ocean freight than just the container. Right. So I guess my question was this. is So you mentioned there's a, there's freight, there's brokers that I could call to get freight forwarding. And do some of them say, hey, I only work with one carrier or two carrier, three carrier? Yes. So you'll see that a lot, especially with the smaller forwarders, they'll have they'll have a relationship with maybe a single carrier or maybe a carrier per lane or a carrier per country. So they so they can't help you in a way that a flexport can that has more relationships. Well, I think that there are I don't wanna I don't wanna knock those forwarders because I think they do add a value to their clients. There are certain things that they can probably do. You know, sometimes being smaller you can you can do things rather that, that more hands on maybe yeah. more hands on. Maybe they have a certain agreement and they have more access to immediate space. But if you're looking at overall across the industry, yeah, I, I, I think that we add value there. I think I always use the analogy, going back to kind of an air analogy because I was in aviation, is that if you're going to take a private plane and fly into Los Angeles, maybe you can call up the operations guy that you know him. He's a buddy of yours and get a landing spot at 3 p.m. But if you're American Airlines, they're going to kind of tell you to work with what you got. But they have more of what they got. So Flexport, I think we have a little bit. We're kind of in the middle there. We got we have to work with what we have. But we have a lot and we have a lot more options and we can move freight on on really any lane we, we want to. Am, am I right to say this also that you guys would do you buy capacity ahead of time knowing that we're going to fill it? Yeah, minimum quantity commitments, MQCs. So it's not really so much a, a, a buy ahead as it just um, negotiating with the carriers around around capacity and how much we think we're going to use and and how we can set that aside for certain clients, especially clients that are on things like fixed rate contracts. We, you know, we, we, we procure capacity specifically for them. So yeah, we do have agreements with the carriers around around certain amounts of volume. Yep. The reason I asked some of these questions is because some of this is just in the past felt like a black box. You know, you you, gave, you got a price, 
you didn't it took forever to get a quote right and then when they started moving it you didn't really hear much until it got to the port and then another 10 days where you got your stuff it seemed like and then you mentioned also the nice thing about working with a flex port and the survival guide is first you're going to understand my current situation you want to understand my risks my needs right then you talk, started talking about alternative solutions. One of the alternative solutions you mentioned was LCL. So that's less than container load. And that's very similar to an LTL product on the trucks, right? Yes. So that's when I can't fill a whole container, but I do need to move my stuff, say Europe to the US, I can call you. Now I've known that LCL has been available for a while though. What do you guys, what's your, how do you, what's your take that makes it different? I think our take is that and I think at a lot of LCL, again, because you're only buying part of the container, it doesn't feel like it's your container. It doesn't feel like it's it's moving on your chain, right? You've kind of kind of had to borrow onto somebody else's. Right. We try and eliminate that. This is your shipment. We're going to move it just like any other shipment. We're going to move it as, as, as transparently as possible, and we're going to take care of it, but also just the speed of it. We want it to move fast. We want to keep the value of speed in there because in an LCL shipment, there are more touches. And also the the clients who are using them, it's usually for a smaller amount of cargo that really needs to move right now. They don't want to pay for a whole container. They only want to pay for the freight that they need. Why force a client into paying for an entire shipping container when they don't need a whole shipping container, right? When that's the alternative solution or force them onto air even, which you mentioned Neil, love Neil, love working with him, but you know, we all know that ocean is cheaper. So if I can get them a solution that fits their need at the best price point and still provides them high quality, that's what we want to do, not just with LCL, but with everything, right? And I think that LCL was always kind of seen as as smaller or maybe cheaper, et cetera. But no, we want it to be a value add to their supply chain. Right. So we talked a little bit about that first step, which is understanding the current state and understanding all my risks, all my problems, right? What's going on? And then you're offering me alternative solutions. And, and that's really what I want. And, 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 and let's face it, those alternative solutions are tied very closely to cost probably. You know, if, if I, I get a price and maybe it's gone up over time and I go, God, my boss is killing me. He's going to, he wants me to get this price lower. You can offer those alternatives potentially with something that is uh, less expensive. Maybe you move me to a different port or a different product. You guys are bringing those alternatives, which by the way, I, I've not done a ton of ocean freight. But I never felt like we had any alternatives. It felt like we are picking something up. You get it when you get it. <laughs> yeah. It can feel that way. And, and we and we definitely work to, to eliminate that. And I think price is also something that, of course, everyone is sensitive to price. Price of the ocean freight drives the price of the goods. And, you know, I don't want to have to pay more for something than I, than I have to. So delivering the right service at the right price, I think that's really important to any business. You don't want a client to have to overpay and buy something that they don't need and and because that's going to create a dissatisfying experience you also don't want a client to underpay and buy less than they need and you want to be able to inform them on that and and let them know like i understand that this is what the price looks like but this is what it's really going to cost you when you get to the end you know if it's if it's a deferred service if it's going to take longer if it incurs more accessorial fees we talked to a client last year who had decided to ship on a lower cost solution when the market was at very high rates, they found out that their container storage fees were astronomical. Oh. And all of a sudden their container is sitting at the port for three or four days. They found out that they only had one day of free time and then escalating costs after that. And, and they're like, yeah, we, we, you know, we, we couldn't execute on it. So we kind of lost the value that we thought we had. So Understanding where your what your costs are going to and where your costs lie is very important in this business and can also be very, very difficult. It's another black box thing. It's like, what am I really paying for? Right. So we talked about the assessment. We talked a little bit about cost and cost versus the, the, the value. Again, you just kind of hit on that. You don't want to push anybody into something that's inexpensive but doesn't meet their needs. And then we talked about how you guys have lots of different alternatives. And a lot of that, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I we before we hit record, a lot of this related to the technology that you guys have and the research and the data that, you know, again, when you come from a tech background, you are going to be interested in analytics more so than the other guys. <laughs> That's just the nature of your biz. So what's the fourth thing that is part of this Ocean Freight Survival Guide? 
Oh, partnerships. Partnership is, is super important, right? You want a freight forwarder or NVO who is a partner with you. You want someone who is collaborating with you to, to drive your business forward. I think Flexport, one of our goals, obviously, is that all of our clients succeed. If our clients are succeeding, so is Flexport. So we want to be there with you. We want to have those discussions with you. And it, it extends beyond just partnership with our clients. Flexport has great partners around the world. We have great partners in all of our origin locations. We have great partners with our trucking companies. We have great partners with our um, warehousing providers where we don't have our own warehouse. And those partners, Flexport partners, become our clients' partners. They have access to all the same things that we have access to because they're moving on our networks. And being in this together and, and working through this together is super important to any business. We don't want to be, have an adversarial relationship. We want to have a complementary relationship. And I think that, and we also don't want to have a transactional relationship because we also talked about tech. Our tech doesn't mean anything if it's not backed up by good people. Right. And we have outstanding people working for us. The reason that we can be so dynamic with the way that we price and the way that we execute on our shipments is because we have people behind it who are just super good at what they do and super passionate about what they do. And we want to be as passionate about our, our clients' goods as the client is. And, and that's super important to us. Yep. And I think about, you know, the visibility. We've talked on the on the domestic freight for a long time, how the important visibility is. It was even more lagging in your business just because the nature of it, you know, again, and getting visibility from China or Europe from some little trucking company that no one can pronounce the name of to, <laughs> to your warehouse in Idaho is significant, significantly harder too than getting uh, it on trucks locally so yeah and and with flexport actually if if you're onboarded completely from end to end if your supplier and your origin trucking team and your destination trucking team and your destination warehouse are all onboarded onto our system you can chat with all of them end to end on one platform and that is something that as you know is is usually a mismatch of texting and wechat and whatsapp and and right, like just that, I think has been a huge selling point to a lot of clients. It's like, wait, I can just talk to them all right here and we can all see each other. Like, yes. <laughs> I, I've said this before on my podcast, but it's very true is end to end visibility was fantastic when we could get it. And by the way, for the most part, we don't have that everywhere, but companies like Flexport are bringing that end to end visibility, but watching, um, a slow motion train crash is no fun, right? So you go, I, I, I have visibility of my freight not moving. Well, that's no fun, right? <laughs> so you just touched on it. Visibility is important, but maybe even more important is the ability to collaborate easily. Yeah, and I think I'll just share one anecdote. Is we had a client who had some receiving issues at their warehouse because they kind of never knew how the container was going to be packed. Something as simple as that. And you would think, of course I would know how my container is going to be packed, but no. And, and these were goods that some of them required special handling based on how the, the lashings and things like that were done. But by connecting them on the platform, the receiving warehouse could ask the origin warehouse, hey, send me pictures. They uploaded them. They were right there. They didn't have to courier them before they were going to a third party who may or may not email them, that whose account did they go to. Now it's, now it's all online. They know exactly what equipment, what kind of labor they need to order in um, because they're using a, a partner warehouse even, so they might not have the specialty equipment. And like, it just made things so much easier just by going through a combined platform where everybody can, can see it. And... Then the trucker in between saw the, 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 the notes and said, hey, if that's the case, here's what I can do and here's what I need to take account of. And, you need, and, and just like having that visibility took a situation where on the receiving warehouse, it could have been a disaster or a delay at the very least. And instead, everybody's now collaborating. Those partnerships become super important and we're facilitating it all on our platform. And really, we weren't even saying anything. It was just all the, everybody who was involved in the, in the shipment talking together and and I think that that's a, a value that a lot of people don't see and doesn't quite translate into price. Oh, God. Yeah, well, I remember I used to work on working with Beijing Jeep. So we launched – Beijing Jeep was obviously a, a business in Beijing, but we were back and forth to Detroit. And I remember we would get containers from them. And it was like Christmas Day, so we called it. Because it like that container, we never knew what was going to be in it. They would send us a fax. Some of it was translated. Some of it wasn't. You mentioned the PDFs that we attached to emails. We we sometimes got those, but mostly we just got faxes. And we would go, okay, here's what should be in this container. And then you don't realize how big a container is until you have to walk into it and take find your stuff. Right? <laughs> and 
then we would say, right, I remember the next, as soon as we get done, we'd send the emails. I didn't get this. I didn't get this. Well, keep in mind, 45 days ago, I thought I was getting this, and now I find out I don't have it. If I have that visibility and the ability to collaborate, I can say, hey, Nathan, you were supposed to send me this, this, and this, and it's apparently not on this container. And you go, oh, shoot, I'll air freight that if you need it, right? And and I don't want to air freight a whole container, but if I have to do some parts for a prototype, go ahead and do it. Anyway, enough of my blather. I'm going to summarize this, and then I want to get your final thoughts on this. Okay. I want you to put a bow on this. So we're talking to Nathan Strang. We're talking about this ocean freight survival guide. And why we need a survival guide is the disruption we saw during COVID, the increased imports. This is not going away. We 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 might have COVID for a while. Regardless of that, we are going to have labor shortages. We seem to have maybe a new normal, but it's not normal yet. Uh, with imports, we have real problems getting things in and out. We potentially have a labor strike, uh, labor problems. Hopefully not, according to Nathan. Nathan didn't promise, though. He just said he didn't <laughs> think so. So um, we talked about four areas. So it, the survival guide really is going to work with a great partner. And that partner is going to understand your current situation, understand your risks, try and take the risk out of it, but understand all your needs, not just this transaction, but all your needs, right? What are you doing for this year so we can start planning it? And maybe that means um, I need some alternative solutions. And the reason, chances are I'm going to talk to you about alternative solutions because of cost, right? So what you like to talk about is different options, different different ways you guys can add value in that chain. So there's a the, the, the assessment, which is part of cost, part of understanding potential options. And then Partnership. If I don't have the right partner, they aren't going to take me through this. They aren't going to take ownership of my problems. I used to say when I ran a little 3PL that if the shipper mentions a problem, it's now ours. (laughs) And that's that's really a basic thing to say because sometimes it's not true. But if you can start to get into that mindset that they mentioned it to you for a reason, see if you can fix it. So, Nathan... Put a bow on this bad boy. Put a bow on it. I think that the most important thing about a survival guide is this is an iterative process. There is no one way and there is no one answer. So those four steps, you have to be doing those continuously. You have to be continually assessing your supply chain. You have to be continually assessing your logistics solutions. And you have to be doing this month over month, quarter over quarter, year over year. Because the the situation changes. Everybody's moving. Everyone's adapting. Everyone's trying to adjust. We saw that with everything all of a sudden shifted to the East Coast. Why? Everyone ran over there. Because everyone's reassessing all the time. So I think the, the risk there is like becoming static and just saying like, I figured it out. Don't, if you feel like you figured it out and you're like, I've got it, now is exactly the time to start the process over again. As soon as you're like, this is it, this is the solution, great, send it, move on to the next solution, let's start reiterating, let's, let's work the process over again, let's start again, and, and, and let's work through the next set of challenges. Nathan, you mentioned people moving to the East Coast. I'm not, I don't think everybody's aware of what's gone on, but what happened is, and I'll give my two cents, the layman version that I want to hear from the pro, people were afraid that there might be a strike on the West Coast. And so big retailers, big production companies said, instead of taking our stuff to the West Coast, take it to the East Coast. And then we ended up with congestion on the East Coast. So what's that's the layman's view. What's the what's the pros say? That's a lot of it. It was it was it was the labor, just also the just the massive amount of congestion on the West Coast. So that was the one was the most the congestion on the West Coast. The other one is like super excellent marketing by East Coast ports. They do a really good job of driving their business because they all have phenomenal products. But then every ran to it and then I mentioned this before in, a, in another uh, discussion where I called it the Disneyland effect, where if you're at Disneyland and you look at the app and it says 15 minute wait on a ride, everyone runs there and then you get in line and it's suddenly 60 minutes. So <laughs> unfortunately, everyone listened, like everyone saw the advice and everyone listened where you really didn't want everyone to move, but they did. But what's the silver lining on that? It caused people to think more about their logistics chain. How do I get my goods closer to the final door in the first move rather than the everything through LA plan and then trucker rail? So directionally correct, executionally needs some work. But I also I also want to give full credit to the to the businesses that brought that business in. The East Coast ports, they do a really good job. They have a really good product and they marketed themselves 
really well last year, and now they're seeing, I guess, the benefit of it. Yeah, and we should say that there's two long there's two longshoremen union. There's the one out on the west coast, and that covers a, not just Long Beach in L.A., but all the way the, west, the whole west coast. And then and then there's the east coast uh, longshoremen union is separate. I I thought they were affiliated. They're not affiliated, and so. When there was a potential that there'd be slowdowns or even a strike on the West Coast, people said, we'll move to the East Coast. And that that could be Puerto Rico. That could be New Jersey, New York, could be uh, Virginia, Savannah, lots, lots of different ports to choose from. And you mentioned those are options. We don't have to be on autopilot. And I think this is where going to work with a good company that says, hey, we understand how this business works. We And if somebody should say, if, if somebody could say, we'll get you to Virginia. And it's it's a little more expensive, but that's where it's go, it's going to West Virginia. Cool. Let's do it that way. Right? It's predictable. If it, it, It's not just cost. It's not just speed. There's a lot of things that go into this. Absolutely. Absolutely. Anyway, Nathan, thank you so much for being on my podcast. But before you go, what's new over at Flexport? Who's your sweet spot? Who do you guys work with mostly? I think we mostly work the best, in my opinion, and not to, not to outsell the other markets, but small to medium-sized businesses, businesses that don't have the size to kind of build their own logistics teams and and do their own research. And, and I think that's who we work with the best. But obviously, we cover the full spectrum. We go all the way from you know, major name brands all the way down to, you know, a couple shipment a year type shippers. So I think we can add value to anybody, really, to anybody's supply chain, but especially those who are looking for a little more, a little more of a leg up, especially. Yeah. And it would seem like the big brands, they would probably be the ones that spend a lot on tech and they would might say, yeah, I like the idea that I can work with a company like Flexport that's got the tech and they can connect. I imagine the small guys like the tech too, but I also imagine you mentioned they might not have the internal expertise. They don't have a research team. They don't have a deep bench. So We really do have something for, for every shipper. And I know that kind of sounds cliche, but we really do. I think from the top to the bottom, everybody finds some value in, in our product. Well, you're doing something right because you guys are growing like a weed. Thank you. Nathan, thank you so much for taking the time. It was really my pleasure. And I didn't say it earlier, but thank you so much for your service. It allows you. people like me not to have to serve. <sighs> Thank you, I appreciate, I appreciate that. that. <laughs> I appreciate that as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nathan. And thank all of you for listening to my podcast. Your support's very much appreciated. Until next time, onward and upward. You've been listening to the Logistics of Logistics podcast, where we engage in conversation with experts in the logistics field. For more details, visit thelogisticsoflogistics.com or follow Joe Lynch on LinkedIn. <laughs>